The Sir William Stevenson sculpture was unveiled on May 5th, 2021 in Celebration Square. The bronze sculpture stands facing out towards the road. Words that appear on the sculpture tell the story of Sir William Stevenson, the man known as Intrepid. But who was Sir William Stevenson and how did this project come to be? It all started from the pages of a book and a conversation about a new public art project between the artist Ruth Abernethy, who created the statue of Len Cullen in Cullen Park, and Len Cullen's daughter, Sue Green. I got the idea from um, a friend of mine to perhaps put a bronze statue of my father at Cullen Gardens in Miniature Village. His name is Len Cullen. So in doing that, I was looking to approach someone that could do a bronze statue, and I uh, researched and found that uh, Ruth Abernathy, who had done Glen Gould on Front Street in Toronto, might be a good fit for this. So I approached her, and she was delightful. I had done a project in Whitby, a private project, a, a portrait of Len Cullen, and that was a beautiful celebration from start to finish. And we did the unveiling, we did the dedication. And there was this great sense of celebration and a number of people came up, including the mayor and, and people who had supported that project and said, you know, this, this is our first real bronze in Whitby. We, we should do this again. <laughs> On that day in 2019, at the Len Cullen's unveiling, a path was set for Sir William Stevenson's place in Celebration Square. Our story begins here. Because I'd done the Len Cullen portrait, and, and there was this wonderful sense that we weren't finished in Whitby. I, I had picked up the used copy of A Man Called Intrepid when I was in Vancouver. And then I emailed Sue Green and said, you know, Sue, we have to do this story. She came and said, I've been reading a book and it's called A Man Called Intrepid. And I was reading through this book and thought, oh, for heaven's sake, you know, this is, this is a project. This is a project we should do. And I had put together some ideas and approached a few key sponsors in, in Whitby, Sue Green, her husband Brian, the mayor. I talked to them and the support was astonishing. It's like, yes, we are in. This is a key story. To me personally, I had not read a lot about him, nor did I know a lot about him. But Ruth's enthusiasm and speaking with Lynn Philip Hodgson, just made one want to know more about him. I gave her about 20 minutes and she wrote back and said, Ruth, I know who to talk to about this. She was absolutely brilliant. I mean, she and, and Brian knew absolutely who to talk to. I mean, the interest was there, but Sue gets full credit for, for putting those details together so that we had a team and a project. I had the opportunity to know about Sir William Stevenson when I was a school board trustee and when we were seeking out to name a school in downtown Whitby, which is now called Sir William Stevenson. A year ago, I was uh, approached by Soup to uh, come for lunch one Sunday afternoon because she had a special guest coming. And this was just after the unveiling had taken place of her father, Len Cullen, and uh, who was there at her home, but Ruth Abernathy. Presentation of bringing a statue to our community was one that was discussed and talking about Sir William Stevenson. Uh, Ruth had done extensive research on her own and uh, I shared with them with my story of how I became involved. Sir William Stevenson was pivotal in the creation of Special Operations for Canada and the Allied war efforts worldwide. One of his greatest successes was the establishment of a secret spy training school bordering Whitby and Oshawa, known to locals as Camp X. Stevenson's story is an important thread in the Canadian tapestry, a story that needs to be told. The best-selling author of Inside Camp X was an integral part of the Sir William Stevenson project. Camp X is a place long overtaken by nature. But Lynn Philip Hodgson's writing of words that were placed in bronze on the giant X of the sculpture allow the story of Sir William Stevenson to live forever. Hodgson takes us back in time and introduces us to the history of Sir William Stevenson. Stevenson was a Canadian born in um, Winnipeg, Manitoba. And after university, he uh, went out into the world of uh, inventing. He invented many, many things, most of them related to electronics, radios and that type of thing. He even actually uh, enhanced the fax machine, what we know as the fax machine back then, for commercial use, away from military use to commercial use. All during the 30s, he traveled extensively throughout Europe. 
selling his, uh, his inventions. And he became a very rich man, living in uh, London, England at the time. Before Winston Churchill became prime minister, he had befriended William Stevenson. Any time that Stevenson came back to London after his, his travels, they'd get together for an evening and talk about the world. The concerns that Stevenson felt were shared with Churchill, who at that point in public perception was an old warmonger. You know, really, who wants to listen to that? But they had kept in touch. Curiously enough, Stevenson was from Winnipeg. How does this guy get in touch with Churchill as a close friend? Because Stevenson is remarkable. He's someone who always had something interesting and relevant and fundamentally important to share. He was the guy who laid down the fundamental steps, wove the fabric on which Bill Donovan stood and Donovan became head of the CIA. But Stevenson was the mastermind. There's a piece that I wanted to read that's in the book and we put it on the bronze because in the reading that we did, it was the best summary of the man. I mean, I couldn't have done it better. And this is from one of his secretaries, I think, who'd worked with him throughout. And, and it's a remarkable description. It went on the bronze, and if you have a chance, you can go down and read it. To those who didn't know him, no words are adequate. To those who knew him, no words are necessary. Intrepid is still the greatest mystery of all. No release from the Official Secrets Act 30 years after will solve that one. Mercurial, magic, masterly, magnificent, these were the epithets used to describe him, yet no one has ever properly defined him, and we cannot do so now. His most conspicuous quality was an inherent capacity to disappear, swift as summer lightning, or if he were confined to, say, an elevator, to make himself invisible. We knew he had escaped from a German prisoner of war camp in World War I, but we didn't know it had been so easy for him. Like the magician's rabbit, he could melt into the mists of the night or into the madding crowd of Fifth Avenue with the speed of a jet, without a sound, without a breath. Uh, no, no, he wasn't the magician's rabbit. He was the magic. Everyone felt it. No one could explain it. Camp X was a top secret training school for secret agents situated in Whitby, Ontario. No one knows the history of this site more than Lynn Philip Hodgson. Before the efforts of Lynn Hodgson to reopen the files on Camp X, little or nothing remained on its history or the man called Intrepid. Uh, Churchill himself, during the summer of 1940, during the Battle of Britain, created in, in desperation something called the SOE, the Special Operations Executive. And that's a branch of the SIS, the Secret Intelligence Service. Creation of that organization changed the the, the, the entire scope of what would happen during World War II. In creating it, he put two men in charge. One was Sir Colin Gubbins, in charge of Britain and all of um, Europe. And he put a Canadian named William Stevenson in charge of the Americas. Stevenson, with that uh, charge, was very anxious to come to back to North America and set up his organization. Churchill said to him, one of the most important things you, you need to do is to get Roosevelt into the Second World War. And then he thought, well, how do I go about that? Well, I've got to get two key players on side. One of them, Bill Donovan of the OSS, the forerunner of the modern day CIA, and the other one, J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI. He asked for meetings with them immediately. He leveled with the two of them and said, this is what I'm going to be doing. Got their blessings and as a matter of fact, said to Hoover, I'm setting up a base in Canada. It's a special school. I'd like you to come up and I'd like you to bring some of your top FBI agents up and take the, the training there. And so he took him up on that. And when Camp X opened, actually got him in, in to experience the training. By 1943, he had over 2,000 people in his operations. And it included all of the Americas. Situated on Lake Ontario, it was here that Ian Fleming, creator of so many books and movies on Britain's James Bond, watched approximately 500 secret agents being trained as part of his naval duties as an intelligence officer in 1942. And though not an agent himself, he did participate in many of the actions to understand just how it felt to experience such an enduring schedule. He started to recruit agents for the European theatre of war, recruited ham operators to operate both the hydro operations, which was the radio communications between Camp X and Bletchley Park in England, but he also 
hired them to be trained as agents to go down to South America and spy on German activities. There were approximately 45 French Canadian agents trained at Camp X in preparation for D-Day. Sir Colin Govins wrote to Winston Churchill after the war and he said, of the 950 special missions that were called for by the BBC on the night of June the 5th, they were successful in over 900 of those missions. And those missions were to derail the Germans so they couldn't come back from Calais where they thought the invasion was going to take place back to Normandy. They clogged up the, uh, the rail lines, they clogged up the highways, they, they, they took out the communications. And it was tremendously successful. And because of that, they saved thousands of lives. And again, he summed it up by saying that with, with the success of the special operations of the SOE, they saved over a, a million lives and reduced the duration of the war up by up to a year and a half. So once we have a design, I'm laying out the figure, front view, side view, cutting my styrene columns in uh, on the bandsaw in, in white styrene and putting them back together. And then, of course, the wicked knife. Worked from photographs, it's nice, fine material, has a nice bit of shove to it. And I can do photographs, which are fabulous because I've done portraits in wax, but wax is like chocolate. It's dark, it's got no shove, it's slow, and you cannot get good photographs because it changes color with heat. <laughs> so uh, it's a modeling clay. Once we get the head to our satisfaction, there's a mold made of the head. That mold allows you to do another heritage bust if you want one. In this case, we've done two. Sculptors who desire to have their artwork cast in bronze must depend on a foundry. For the making of Sir William Stevenson's bronze sculpture, Ruth Abernathy worked with Castaway Foundry, located in the hills of Erin, Ontario. Castaway Foundry, owned by Jim Wilson, is a family-run art foundry with over 25 years experience. I really don't know much about Stevenson. I didn't read all the text. <laughs> I was just looking at the castings. Uh, my name's Jim Wilson and I run an art foundry. Been in the business my whole life. Jim and I have worked together for nearly 25 years. He knows what I'll bring him. You know, it's, that's sort of the basis of the whole thing, is that the lost wax process means that he can burn away what I take to him. It is lost in the process of making the bronze. Ruth, I've worked with Ruth many years, many years. Yeah, she knows the process inside and out, and easy to work with. Yeah, she has it all figured out. This was a hard one. It was a lot, there was a lot of text on the, the casting. One of the challenges we had was to keep everything, you know, tight and square and true. So that was the tricky part, because you get distortion in wax, you get distortion in casting. To bring it back to square was tough. The text was pretty tight, pretty small, and it has to be a flawless casting. Otherwise, it's scrap, and this is, it's a one-shot deal. She'll bring me a piece, and I'll have to cut it into manageable size pieces and reassemble it. And then I'll have to make a ceramic shell around that, and uh, I'll have to melt the styrofoam out, and then pour wax into that mold, and then it'll go back to the slurry tank and build a ceramic mold of that section. And then wax will get melted out of that, and then bronze will get poured into that ceramic mold. And then the ceramic gets chipped off, and then assembly. I couldn't have done this project on my own without my lead hand, Blair Hicks. He's a welder, finisher, wax room technician. Oh yeah, we're lucky to have him. Castaway Foundry has a continued dedication to the pursuit of excellence from start to finish, which can be reflected in the relationship with the artist Ruth Abernethy. Their craftsmanship and preserving the integrity of the original sculpture of Sir William Stevenson. For the Stevenson project, my part was building the big X. Uh, I believe it was about 10 feet, 10 feet long. There were so many small details with the X that kind of came together as I started to do the research. And uh, as Ruth mentioned, we did the Bookman old style font. And I started by printing out a copy of a large X on paper. And from there, I worked out all the, the little details. And you know, who would have known that the small arm on that X was 50 degrees and the large arm on that X was 53. So there was just a lot of small, minute details that you really had to hammer out <laughs> in the math and the research first before we started carving. I can discuss the project and the concept and the cost uh, at any point with Jim Wilson at the Foundry, whose skill I rely on and whom I trust beyond <laughs> 
probably beyond all reason. Uh, Jim just is an excellent problem solver. You know, we're on the same page when it comes to public safety on all the surfaces. Putting that X together, I think, I think, as I said to him, this is worse than Oscar Peterson's piano, isn't it? And he, well, he laughed. <laughs> it was worse. Uh, a terribly complicated piece of metalworking. Just, the guys just, blew my circuits on this one. I entrusted them with it. I had no doubt that they would do exactly what I needed, but the work that they've brought to this, uh, just without compare. Uh, Blair Hicks did most of the work on the X, you know, talked through with Jim, of course. I'm very honored to be part of what I feel is a real legacy piece for the town of Whitby. And I think that people will come from far and wide to actually see this piece, Sir William Stevenson, Camp X. It's been a great project to work on, and quite frankly, the result is in the, uh, in the statue. It's the stillness that they comment on. Several of his cohorts and peers uh, comment on his stillness. This laser focus, and the kind of person who doesn't draw attention to themselves. And in Whitby, that's exactly what we've got. We've got this guy who is sort of quietly uh, watching the street. Now who he's watching for or what exactly he's hoping to glean is the element of suspense in the story. It's a silhouette. I mean how perfect this this man who's known for stillness is forever in bronze and perpetually still. Where many of my pieces are actually quite animated, Stevenson is the inverse of that. It's the very stillness of this silhouette and the fact that uh, we have purposely put his back to the south, which in fact you don't do for, for public bronze because they're always backlit. So you kind of can't see who's there, but in this case, it was perfect. The amazing works of art created through bronze sculpture will be here as a legacy for generations to come. Our stories told in a time-tested method.